that prayer, Wayne, and uh, we certainly thank God for you, uh, and we're glad for Cheryl, and uh, Miss Penny's on the other side of the computer, uh, in on what we're looking at today. So today we are looking at Job chapter 39. Now, um, if you remember in 38, that God broke through through the storm, and what it said in the beginning of 38, and this is part of the continuance of that, it says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, all right, so then we saw all that he said, which we already talked about last week in 38, and he's continuing the answer. I find it interesting that, um, and I kind of pointed that out last week, and I want to point it out again today, is that the answer is not, well, Job, this happened because you did this or you forgot to do this. Or he's, th Those are not the kind of answers he's given. He's given Job answers that have to do with all the universe and, and, the, and the galaxy and the constellations and, and the, ray, the way uh, wind and rain and darkness and light are formed and so he's letting Job know that, Job, your problem is just not isolated to you, nor to your family, nor to the people that affected you. It has to do with all creation, with all reality. Um, to what degree? Well, once again, I can't give you any numbers or measurements. I don't know. But the fact that when God says he's going to, he answers, and he answers from the world, and he gives them those explanations. Well, uh, like I said, he was out talking about the stars and, and, the, and the various things in the sky and in heaven. Today, he continues that, but he's going to bring it a little closer uh, to where we live and dealing with some of the nature stuff that we interact with every day. Um, and I find it kind of, I, I think that when God does this, he starts, comp it's almost like he's going to do a comparison. And you say, well, uh, well, what does it mean when he starts naming all of these different uh, aspects about nature? Um, my main answer is, I don't know all that it means. Uh, what I can say is that God has never done anything or said anything that was irrelevant, that was just happenstance. Everything that God does or says has meaning and purpose. And it's for us to seek it out. Uh, God will, will hide the, the answers to a lot of things, and he said it's the, it's the glory of a king or, or those that desire to go search it out. Uh, the scripture tells us to, uh, uh, to study, to show thyself approved. And so if that's what we're doing. We're going in here, we're looking at this, and we're going to see what we can uh, identify to what God is saying to Job that we might be able to say, oh, I recognize that, and then apply it to our own life. All right, so let's go ahead and let's get the reading in for chapter 39. Let's take a listen. And actually, let me uh, set this up so everybody can hear it. There we go. Share the audio. And now we'll put it on. Chapter 39. Chapter 39. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do pan? Canst thou number the months that they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bring forth? They bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows. Their young ones are in good liking, they grow up with corn, they go forth and return not unto them. Who hath sent out the wild ass free? Or who hath loosed the bands of the wild ass? Whose house I have made the wilderness, and the barren land his dwellings? He scorned the multitude of the city, neither regarded he the crying of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searcheth after every green thing. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? Give 
first down the goodling wings unto the peacocks, wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear, because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifteth up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed man. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him the glittering spear and the shield. Swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage, neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, Ha, ha, and he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shout. Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom, and stretch her wings toward the south? Doth the eagle mount up at thy command, and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, on the crag of the rock, and the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood, and where the slain are, there is she. Alright, so there we go with chapter 39. Now, when I read through this and I was studying through this, I was I kind of chuckled a little bit because um, you look at this as being an answer to Job's issues and to Job's uh, uh, problems. And one of the things that you can see kind of right off the bat is, is God is drawing a comparison to how we are and how we see things versus how uh, the wild animals are. Um, and you can almost get the feel to say that the Lord is saying, you know, look at them and we'll point out each one of them. He said, look at them, look at how they act and how they do in the strength in which they were developed and, and, and created to do. Uh, and they go on about, they go on about their tasks. And yet man was created to do, and man seems to try to do everything except what he was created to do. So you say, well, what was man created to do? Man was created in the image of God, and we were made as uh, 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 worshipers to worship God. And that's the one thing that we try to do everything but that. And even when we do turn into worshipers, because we are worshipers by nature. And you say, well, how do you know that? Oh, how do I know? What is the biggest industries in the world? Industries where other people are worshipped. We worship our sports figures. We worship celebrities. We worship anybody that has any type of fame or fortune. Or any, you know, anytime somebody does good, we flock to it. You go to some of these um, uh, concerts where you see some of these bands playing and people are falling out and fainting and yelling and screaming. Why? Because that's what we are. We do that by nature. It's in us to do. Um, and it's going to happen. And, and we find a lot of ways to admire others for what they're doing. And there's nothing wrong with admiring others, but you should also make sure that you utilize that which comes to you naturally to worship and to give glory to your creator, to the one that is beyond all uh, uh, that you can think or see. He is the one that has no cause, that has no beginning. And we need to make sure that we recognize that. And we, that's something that we don't do. And that's what God also is going to point out here um, when we look at this uh, uh, study. So we see here that this is once again part of the answer. And, and so he goes on in verse 1 and he says, Knowest thou the time of the wild goat, of the rocks uh, that bring forth or that cast uh, their mark when their hinds do cast? All right, so first thing he does is he says, Job, you, you want to you answer? Let's talk about goats. Now right off the bat, when somebody says, well, you know, I know you got a problem and we want to try to solve the problem. 
And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go out and we're going to take a look at some goats. All right, well, I mean, what's the nature about a goat? Goat has some, some very interesting uh, known qualities. They're stubborn, right? It's hard to sometimes to, to get a, or train a goat. And another thing about a goat that, that you can find to be a problem is a goat will eat anything, all right? And so I almost laugh at that because I go, well, that's kind of like what we say, you know, we, we are. We can be stubborn. God's trying to get us to do something, and we we fighting against it. We're butting against it. We're pushing against it. And then God's trying to give us up, but then somebody else come along with some other kind of philosophy that has nothing to do with what God is doing, and we gobble that right up. It's called false doctrine, false teaching. All right, learning to do things. And so I think it, I, I had to laugh there when I looked at that, and I go, "Wow!" Right off the bat, he's saying, "Okay, Job, you want to know the answer." Take a look at the goat. Right? But he talks about the goat. And then he says uh, how the goat maneuvers amongst the rocks. They're very sure-footed. You know, they know how to climb up these steep mountains and, and, and stuff. They have very uh, uh, sophisticated hooves that allow them to, uh, you know, to not slip and fall. And then he goes, uh, when... When their calves get pregnant, look at verse 2. Do you number uh, uh, the months uh, that they fulfill? All right. Now, that's something that uh, we as, as human beings can learn and discover and can actually give an answer to. I don't know what it is on the top of my head, but I'm sure there's somebody that's raising goats somewhere that knows that when a goat gets pregnant, it's going to deliver after a certain amount of months. So when we look at these questions that God answers, remember, not all the questions are unanswerable, but all the questions apply to Job's, to, to Job's answer. Because see, these are, these are not questions that God is asking, trying to stump us. God is not answering these questions saying, you'll never know the answer to these questions. That's not why he's, he's bringing these up. He's bringing these up as a means for Job to understand his place and his circumstance and his situation amongst everything else. And sometimes that's important for us to, 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 to get. Um, the reason why I, 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 I said that I kind of chuckled uh, because when God, God starts talking to Job about goats um, and you would expect when somebody's having a problem or a difficulty, you want people to be reverent you want people to be uh, solemn. You want people to have, you know, a serious demeanor about them when things, you know, that are difficult happen. So somebody gets into a, a, a bad situation medically and, you, and then you come around giggling and laughing, they will get the feeling because of how we know how we are as human beings that you don't consider my, my situation a real problem. You don't think it's, it's, it's a big deal. And... So as a human uh, a species, we look at that as kind of like, uh, you know, a bad, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A bad um, uh, a social behavior, right? Whereas God knows that what Job is going through is not a major situation. Number one, God knows how it's going to end. And God also knows that this realm that we live in is not the realm in which we should set our affection. The scripture tells us to, to set your affection on things on, on high. So our affections and our hearts should be tied to the things of God, not to the things of this world. And so God knows that. And so he, yeah, he kind of tells Job, you know, you know, consider these goats, man. <laughs> if you want to know your problem, you want to know why this is happening to you, look at the goats. Now, here's another thing about a goat. As stubborn and as tough as he is, uh, he don't have what you have, Job. He don't have the understanding that you have. Because you can learn about certain things. Like when he asks the question, do you know how many months it takes for the, for the calf to, to give birth? Well, you might not know it, but you as a human being can go figure that out. But what can goats figure out about you? They're very what? Limited. So, right off the bat, you begin to appreciate, wait a minute, I'm not locked into goat intelligence. 
or I'm not locked into goat, the goat realm, I have the ability to be more like God than a goat does. Though my circumstance is not what I want it to be, my makeup is far better. I'm made to be more than what the goat is made to be. So therefore, I need to have some sense of like, wow, okay, don't take that for granted. All right? And we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't take certain things for granted because it's just, well, it seems obvious. Sometimes the obvious things are the most important things. All right? Like the fact that you say, well, I woke up today. Well, that's obvious. And it's also the most important. You know, and sometimes that's important. Let me just, uh, my job is pinging me here. Let me do this and stop them from sending this to me. That's why y'all hear that. That's my job talking, but I got to shut it down. Well, it is shut down, so why is it still talking? All right. So I got to turn off the notification. I'm sorry. My job is just... Who is that? Let me just see who this is. All right. Quit. Let's see if that does it. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So, now, in looking at this from the standpoint of being grateful that we have the opportunity to develop and to grow. And that's what we can apply to each of these animals, each of these situations in nature. These uh, creatures have very uh, uh, great abilities. Some have greater abilities than we have, which we will explore. But what they don't have is the ability that we have to know God the way uh, we can, where we can become a, 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 a grafted in child of God. All right. That's not what the goat got. And then so we, as we continue, we're going to look at these other animals and we'll, we'll bring out. But that's the underlying philosophy that we're applying to each of these individuals. All right. Each, each of these creatures that we're going to bring up. And so it says in verse three, uh, still talking about the goats. They bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows. All right, so what is it saying? So the minute that a, a, a goat brings forth their young, they're not worried. I mean, you don't see goats lined up at the, at the you know, depression center, you know, looking for counseling. They're, they're, they're not going there. They're like, hey, you know what? I delivered my young. I'm good. I'm climbing. I'm I'm climbing up the mountain again. So we sing that song. I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain. Well, the ghost just climbing it. They climbing it and they ain't even worried. They're not. They're just going about their thing. And so, can we have our, uh, as much sense as the goats to just go on and do what you were supposed to do? The goat had no idea how long. See, the, the question about how long, how many months does a, a goat carry before it gives birth? The, the ignorance is showed forth to the goat. The goat has no long, has no idea. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, expecting to bring forth a calf. I know it's going to be in five months or six months or whatever the case may be. It just knows that whenever it brings forth, it brings forth. It, it's not sitting there marking the calendar about the, the time it's supposed to be bringing forth. It doesn't have that kind of intelligence, but we do. And so does Job. And so has Job been able to look and go, well, you know what? I've been carrying this burden for a while, but I know that I won't carry it through eternity. Has Job thought of that? Has he applied that? All right. But the minute this, this, this goat carrying this burden, still climbing up the rough side of the mountain. But once it gives birth, 
it just goes on. It doesn't have any more sorrow. But that's how animals are. And that's just one. We're going to see some more. Let's take a look at some more of these. It says in verse, in verse 4, it says, And their young ones are in a good liking. They grow up with corn. Uh, they go forth and return not unto them. So what he's saying is the young when the young mountain goats are born, they just start climbing the mountain too. See, when a young human is born and you put him up on the side of a mountain, he gonna die. See, a parent that does that is gonna be in some trouble for for mishandling and misusing uh, uh, their, their rights as, as parents. But the goat is born and already has some basic instinct that we as human beings, we can learn to climb mountains, but it's going to take us some time. We got to first learn to walk and learn to talk, learn to stand up. All right. But we will get there. But certain animals, they don't go through that learning process. They, they, they're born and able to walk, to move on. But can we thank God for our development to go from one stage to another? Because the fact that we have that ability means that we can go from being sinful to godly. We can go from, from having our own filthy righteousness to the righteousness of Christ. We can make that development. We can make that jump. We can grow without just having basic instincts that don't have any uh, ability to be developed. All right, verse 5. Who have set out the wild ass free? Now we're talking about the donkey, right? Or who has loosed the bands of the wild ass? All right, so now you're talking about a donkey out there. He ain't, you know, he ain't worried about anything. He's got strength and he's got his ability to just be out in the wilderness. And he's out in the wilderness, he doesn't have any shelter. He doesn't have any electricity. He don't have any internet to get connect to the Zoom call. He's just out there in the wild. But guess what he is? He's doing his thing. He's okay. He's not talking about what he doesn't have. God made me to be a wild donkey, and that's what I am, and I'm, I'm happy out here being a wild donkey. Okay, what about us? We got every reason and every way that we can complain. All right. He goes on. Look at verse 6. Whose house I have made the wilderness. All right. We already touched on that. So the donkey lives where? He's comfortable where? Out in the wilderness. Well, it's going to rain. The donkey ain't worried about it. It's going to be hot. That's what the wilderness is like. It's going to be, it's, it, it's going to snow or it's going to, you know, uh, you know, when the weather changes, it doesn't affect how he sees life. He's just out there doing what he does. We don't seem to always have that. We have reasons to complain. It says, and, and the barren lands, he, uh, his dwelling, lands that don't seem like, it ain't, this is not land, the land of milk and honey. This is land that doesn't have, and yet he's okay. He's happy out there just being who he is. That's a lesson to learn. Can we be happy being worshipers of God? A lot of times we're not. We're not happy being worshipers of God. We want to find and do other things outside of what God has called us to do. Uh, and you say, well, why would you say that way? Well, that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. God made them, Adam and Eve, to live in the garden. But they weren't happy there doing what they needed to do to stay. So they found a way to circumvent what was the, the, the boundaries that were put there for them. And they ended up in sin and in a situation where they were living in death. Because he said, the day you eat of it, you shall die. Right? Whereas the donkey and the, uh, the goat, they stay right where they were designed to stay. We don't. Let's keep going. So you see, all of this is, all of this is part of the answer to Job. It's complex. It's a lot. 
it, I, I find, and I, I see it kind of overwhelming. I think God makes his point, but he makes it over and over and over and over. And so you would almost want to say, okay, enough. I get it. I get the point. But he keeps going. See, we, we and that's another thing. We, we get like, okay, stop talking. I get it. Right? <laughs> we, we're quick to do that. But God has given him example after example after example. And, and as we go through this, see, I could just go, okay, God uses animals to talk about how Job is and how he is not. And we can move on to the next chapter. But I, 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 I try to give the word the respect because it is God's word and not look at it as just being, well, it's just something that he said. That he said the same thing. And this is what, 30, 30 different verses? He said the same thing 30 different ways. And you could say that and you could pretty much get the feel for it. But I think it's worth looking at each one of these and seeing what it is that he's, he has to say. And it seems a little redundant. It seems a little overkill, but that's how God delivers. And so am I going to say, well, God, that's kind of wordy. <laughs> you didn't have to say all of that. No, I'm not. I'm not going to say that. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, sometimes I debate amongst myself whether I should go through this and just kind of sum it up because it's saying the same thing. And I go, no, I'm not doing the word justice if I just sum it up because this is, then I'm not looking at it as the word of God. I'm looking at it as something that I'm, trying to just figure out and move on when the word of God is not something you figure out because you never totally figure it out you don't just know it you have to continually embrace it and that's why it's important to read it over and over I, I done read the Bible you know up, up, umpteen times fine keep reading it because it's alive and that's the key that we forget sometimes the word of God is not just uh, text on paper it's a, it's a lie. Now, that's if you believe it. If you don't believe that, then, it's, then it, it doesn't give you the same effect. And that's why we take our time and go through it like this. All right? So look at verse 7. It says, He, is, he, he scorns the multitude uh, of the city, neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. All right? So the wild donkey, the ass is just as happy as he can be, out there in the wilderness and out there, you know, uh, uh, in the barren lands. And he can care less about the city. The city got all those niceties. He don't care. He's happy with what he has. And so, um, you know, the person that's trying to drive him and trying to make the donkey go some one way or another, the donkey's like, well, you know what? You know, I'll go that way if I feel like it. <laughs> and if I don't, I won't. That's, that's how, uh, you know, uh, they can be sometimes. And uh, and he don't care, you know, that the person that's trying to drive him is complaining and whining. He ain't worried about it. Because his mind is not one that's going to be set on feeling worried. And if you notice the trend here, these first few uh, 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 animal descriptions, neither one of them in their circumstance gets worried or overwhelmed or depressed about this circumstance. All right, so you can almost see why this would be an example to Job because Job, in his circumstance, was overwhelmed, depressed, feeling a little misused. All right, but he kept going. All right, let's keep going here. Verse 8. The rage of the mountain and, the, and his pasture, and he... Uh, searcheth after every green thing. All right. So, what is it in the the the, uh, the donkey's trying to do? I'm just looking for something green. What to eat? Now that that you can take that and apply that even to us sometimes about how sometimes we can be, but it's it's in a negative sense. Because sometimes man is always searching for something green. What kind of green? The dollar bill, the money thing. But all the donkey's worried about is filling his gut. That's all he's concerned about. I'm looking for something green that I can nibble on. All right? And so, but he's okay with that. He's, he finds satisfaction. What do we find satisfaction in? David summed it up when he said, Oh, that I might know you. Talking about the Lord, that I might know him. 
when he when you read that and when we get to Psalms, we'll we'll get to see a lot of that that David learned. But that was the key. And then he said that I might he said that I I, I long to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then he also said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. So in each one of those circumstances, the thing that David looked at as the valuable thing is to know that I'm with God. Man, if I know that, I'm not worried. I can be like the goat on the mountain or the donkey in the wilderness and just be content because I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm with God. But we don't do that. We're not content like the, 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 the mountain goat on the mountain or the donkey, the wild ass in the wilderness. We're not content because we feel we should have something else rather than just being with God. All right? But he continues. All right? He look at verse 9. He says, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? Now, uh, people say, well, unicorns, are they real? Well, it's, it's in here. I, 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 I'm, I'm not a, uh, an expert on uh, ancient creatures, but the, uh, the, the, um, the drift that's being pointed out here is that this is a powerful beast. If it's a unicorn, if unicorns do exist or did exist, it was a powerful thing. Uh, it was it a, a powerful horse or a big, you know, a, a, a bison beast? Whatever it is, we're going to say unicorn because that's what it says here in the King James. And other versions of the scripture have another have other animals probably listed. But the key is power, strength. Okay, and and if you think of a unicorn, you think of this powerful beast with this horn at the top. You know, so you can almost think about a rhinoceros, right? You think of that, all right? And, and so you say, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide in thy crib? So if you got a rhinoceros, are you going to tame a rhinoceros to do what you want it to do? Not going to happen. So what is he saying? You're not going to get this animal to, to, to think like you think. To, to, to work the fields like you can get a cow you know, or a horse to do. It ain't going to happen. He goes on. Canst thou bind the unicorn uh, with his band uh, and, 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 and the forward? Or will he uh, hollow the valley after thee? In other words, will he plow your fields? Will he go into your valleys, into, into your fields, and into your land? And will he plow? Can you put a harness to him and make him work? Probably not. Why? Because he's going to do and show strength to his own desire. All right? Well, that's once again speaks to us. He's doing what he has. I, I have strength. Wow. You have strength too. You have the strength to trust God, to believe him. The scripture says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you have the ability to have faith in God. But will you? But here's the key. If you have faith in God, what is more stronger? What can take you? What can overcome you? Nothing. Nothing. Nobody. Paul said, I'm persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God. And that's way more powerful than this beast. If you have the love of God in you and you know that God loves you and y'all and you have joined yourself to him, what's going to separate you? What's powerful enough to separate you? There is nothing. Neither death, nor life, nor heaven, nor hell, nor things to come, nor things that are in past. Nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. The most powerful thing there is. Right? And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Look at verse 11. Will thou trust him? All right. Uh, because his strength is great. Or will thou leave thy labor uh, to him? 
thou uh, wilt thou believe him that he will bring home the seed and gather it into thy barns? In other words, so are you going to believe and trust him? He's got a lot of strength, this unicorn or whatever the, the, the beast is. He's got a lot of strength. But can you trust him to be uh, 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 workable enough that I will, I will trust next year's harvest to me being able to harness his strength? And the the uh, the unanswered question, the unanswered answer to this question is, you better not. You better not trust him. But there's something more powerful than him that you should trust. And that's who? That's God. So you look at these answers that God has given to Job, man, and 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 like I said, these are things that I, I'm sure I'm just touching the the you know, the top of the iceberg with what it actually means because these are answers. And these answers are not just to Job's plight, but they speak to all of us. That's why they're in the Word of God. If we're willing to dig them out. If we're willing to go in and take a look at it. All right? So we're looking at all of these different animals. Let's go. Let's, let's keep going, though. You go, you know, you would almost want to be like, okay, I get it, God. I get it. I get it. En enough with the animal stuff. No, he keeps going. Look what he does. Verse 13. Givest thou the goodly wings unto the, the peacock? In other words, did you give those beautiful wings to the peacock? We've seen how they, when they open up there, they fan out their wings, how, how beautiful and the colors are. All right? So now God is talking about one thing, which is beauty. And what can beauty do in our world? Well, beauty can get you a lot of things. You know, if you got a certain look, a lot of doors will open up for you. And, and, and you, you see all the studies that they have about, you know, one person go and they happen to be attractive and they go apply for certain things and they don't get, and, and they get what they, you know, uh, what they want. But then they have somebody that's more average and ordinary and they seem to be overlooked and whatnot. There's a lot to what beauty is. Now, here's the thing, though. God made beauty, and God knows how to use it. And beauty is something that is defined by God, not by man. See, man looks on the what? Outward. God looks on the what? The inward. Some of the most beautiful things that have ever existed, we would never notice it with our eyes. We would have to see it with our spirit. And, some, and, and so when you look at the peacock, you go, wow, look at this. He's got that fan of feathers, you know, and it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. And that's how he attracts his mate and, and all these other things. All right, well, that's good. And God says, well, yes. And man has beauty, but man always tries to perfect his outward beauty and never tries to uh, develop his inward. Boy, the beauty industry, we spend time with fingernail polish and with hair gel and, and with, you know, clothes and fashion and, and got to get the, the, the hair just right and the beard trimmed and, the, uh, you know, and all this kind of stuff that we do to bring forth this so-called image of beauty. But how much do we spend developing the beauty that God's looking at? See, God wants to see you as beautiful too. But what is God looking at? Is he talking about, ooh, I like the way you trimmed your beard. You look good. Or I like the way you did your hair. Is, God, is that what God's going to compliment you on? Or is he going to compliment you on how you are on the inward? Your spirit, your soul. Remember what Jesus said. He said, when I was sick, you did what? You came and visited me. I was not doing, you know, I, I was uh, uh, in prison and you came and you, and you visited me and, and and I was hungry, and you fed me, and I was thirsty, and you gave me the drink. He complimented those types of things. But they come out of inward de uh, desires to want to help and to care for others. Those are the things that God looks at. All right? But he goes on. And he says, all the wings and the feathers uh, un unto the ostrich. He says, look at the ostrich. Look at how powerful his wings are. 
Now, see, the peacock's wings are beautiful, but they don't really make them fly any better. And look at the ostrich wings, how powerful they are, but the ostrich can't fly at all. So that shows you that you can have a lot of outward stuff that actually is what? Useless. And I'm trying, well, I got to go get all this done, all this, you know, things done to the outward, and it's what? Useless. It will, it will profit you nothing. All right? Look at verse 14. So now he's talking about the ostrich with his feathers. He says, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warms them in the dust. Look at verse 15. And forgetteth that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. All right. So saying now, you look at how powerful and strong the outward beauty of the ostrich wings are. But look at how, but, but he ain't caring. He ain't loving. The minute he, the ostrich drops its eggs, it's moving on. And the sad thing about it is, see, that's not how humans were, were, were made. We're made in the image of God. We're made to love and to care like God does. But there are some people that will give birth and will just go. I don't care about. Or will say, I'm pregnant and I don't want this thing to stop me from doing. And they call it a thing when it's really a human being, a soul, a life, and they will abort it. Like an ostrich just will forget about his egg and don't even worry. I'll step on it. I could care less. Or I don't care if somebody else steps on it or eats it. But you can admire the powerful wings. But look at how uncaring it is. So God is pointing that out. But there's more to the ostrich. God's not finished with the ostrich. All right? So, but but I think you get the point there of saying that sometimes that outward thing that we admire don't say nothing about how they are in the in inward. But, but look at this. 16. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. She is hard. She don't care about her children at all. And you know what? There's no fear. I don't care about them. And I, ain't, I don't care that I don't care. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? The ostrich was like, do you care about your, 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 your eggs? No. Well, how do you feel about not caring about your eggs? I don't care about not caring. Says a lot about that. All right? That speaks a lot to what we need to make sure we don't do. All right? But that's how she is. That's how, but, but we're going to see here in these next couple of verses. She's doing, though, what was designed. What's your excuse? What's my excuse? I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me, let me, get, let me, let me get this in before I, I go there. Verse 17. All right? And then you look at verse uh, 14, 15, and 16. Look at 17 says, the, the ostrich is like this. Why? Because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted unto her understanding. All right? So, as I was getting ahead of myself. So now when you read that, you can say to yourself, now I get it. I know why the ostrich is the way it is and why it doesn't care. Because that's how God is. God deprived her of that wisdom. But he did not deprive that from us. Right, but the 20 I, I, the 20 I not put it in the metal ostrich because you'll sit on the egg. You know, that's the funny part. Right. You know? Yep. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at this, you say, well, okay, if, if they have designed that way, well, what happens when we as human beings act like that? Mm -hmm. It's not because we're designed that way. It's because we choose to be. So when we choose to be uncaring, when we choose to not be compassionate about some, somebody, when we choose to be uh, lacking in understanding, I don't want to know the issues because I don't want the problem. And you know why I don't want to know the issue? Because I don't want to have to care. Sometimes people can get like that. I don't want to care for you. I don't want to know what you're going through because then I got to be, you know, but we should want to 
care and pray for all. The scripture tells us, love your enemies. Important piece. Verse 18 uh, says, uh, what time uh, she lifts up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and the rider. Now, look at that. So what it's saying is, with all the issues that the ostrich has, powerful feathers but can't fly, can deliver huge eggs but not even care and, de and try to develop it. But you want to know something? Put an a ostrich next to a horse and a rider and see who's going to run faster. That ostrich has an ability. Why? Because it was given to it by God. It has something that it can do well. So even somebody with all these problems can find the gift of God in it. What about us? Well, I got, I got all these issues. My parents didn't have nothing. I was born with all kinds of uh, uh, disease or sickness or I didn't have no wealth and I was born on the wrong side of town or, I, you know, you can name excuse after excuse. But there's something that God has in you that the Lord would like to develop. And you need to go and seek the Lord so he can show you what it is. Knock and he, shall, and he will answer. Seek and you will find. All right? And that's an important part of our life. That's why we're here. To go to God so God can show us who we are. Not to make life wonderful here. Because this is not the, the place where it's all going to be wonderful. This ain't the, the place where you know, you're going to get all the goodness. All the goodness is eternity. eternity. And that's just the realities of it. But sometimes we try to force it to be here. And then we get frustrated because it doesn't happen here. It's not going to happen here. No matter how much we push and pull and tug and fight, you're not going to get heaven here. It's going, heaven's going to be in heaven. But you will have opportunities to know God. And if you can be satisfied like David, I just want to be next to God. I just want to know that he's with me. And then Jesus says, I will in no wise cast you out. Lo, I'm always with you. I'm comfortable now. I'm good. And so that's where our desires have to be. Can we be satisfied with Jesus alone? Or we need Jesus to something else? But the thing to keep in mind is, if we know God, and we are with God and God's with us, guess what? Whatever that something else that you might think you want, you already have it. Why? Because it's in God. So you just trust God. Just lean on him. Everything is in him. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. So if you're with God, there's nothing that you don't have access to if he chooses to give it to you. All right. Let's keep going here. Uh, verse 19. Hast thou given the horse strength? Oh, so now we're going to switch to the horse. Well, that's a powerful animal, isn't it? All right. Uh, has thou clothed his neck with thunder? Powerful, I mean, uh, muscles, you know, shoulders, neck, right? Why? The horse has something in him that it, took, it, it, it takes to learn. You don't know that it's in him unless you put him in a certain, certain situation. And sometimes you don't know what's in you until you get put into certain situations. And the horse is one of those things. One of those animals that you would look at him and be like, well, it's just another animal in the field. No, the horse has something else in him. And God's going to point it out here in a minute. And we know about it. We've seen it. We know exactly what it is. But now God's going to point it out to us. Look at what he says. Can thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? Horse has courage. A horse doesn't get fearful very quickly. A horse can, can be uh, taught to be able to, to manage itself in the midst of all kinds of battle. A horse can go, which is why militaries use horse. Even to this day, police officers still use horses. Because a horse can handle 
uh, the sudden situations better than other uh, animals can and can still be controlled and, and directed in the midst of all kinds of things happening around us. The glory of the nostrils is terrible. When a horse is fierce and it's and it's it's been trained and it's in the midst of doing battle, the that that the, you know the energy that's coming out of the horse is powerful. Look at twenty one. Uh, he pours in the valleys and rejoices in his strength. When he's galloping and running and his his, his hoofs are hitting the ground, it's just something. To, to just see. I mean, how many old westerns we see the horses just running through. <clears throat> you know, and just a beautiful thing. God's pointing that out. He goes unto, uh, unto meet with armed men. So he goes into uh, uh, a skirmish with men that have swords and arrows and guns and, and, and you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to see this in a minute. Verse 22. He he mocketh at fear. I like that. The horse mocks at fear. The, the fear comes around. Oh, you should be afraid. A horse be like, you better get out of here. That says something, huh? Speaks to us. Speaks should, this this particular statement should also speak to Job. Because see, a lot of times our, our frustration, our anger comes from fear. Fear that it's not going to go the way we want it to go. When the way it should go is the fact that I just need to be in the presence of God. If I have that, then I'm good. But we keep adding these other things to add up to our good. Now, I'm in the presence of God, but I also want this. Be okay in the presence of God. Be okay knowing that the Lord is with you. If you can learn that, and that's something you have to learn. Like this horse learns to be fierce in battle. Can you learn to be fierce in battle? I don't have no fear. Why? Because I'm walking with God. David pointed it out. I will say it again. So I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. There it is again. This aspect of knowing that God is with you is so powerful if you allow it to be. But if you don't allow it to be, you're going to be fearful one day, happy the next, scared the next, because you're going by daily happenings. And daily happenings determine whether you are happy. You're happy because you got certain things happening. Right? But that's not the way it should be. We should be always having the, the joy of the Lord. So he mocks at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. He looks at the sword and like, yeah, I'm going, I'm coming right, right at you. I'm not worried about it. Now we look at this. We use the word sword, and I, I, I have to pull this out and say, okay, well, he uses him. I'm not afraid of the sword. What do? What's another uh, type for the word of God? The sword. So are you afraid of the word? Because the word will tell you about yourself. The word, the Bible says the, the word of God is like a two-edged sword. And, and it, 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 it cuts asunder. It cuts even to the marrow, divided between the, even, the, the soul and the spirit. The word of God will tell you who you are. It will separate your intentions from, what you, from, what your, from your actions. See, we are good at doing something and have a little bit of a slant to the motivation until we get caught, then we, we, we even it out. We're good like that. I've done it. I've seen people do it. We all do it to a certain degree. But can we get to the point where I can let, let the word tell me what's my real motivation? What am I really trying to do here? What am I really trying to gain? What's my end game? What do I really want out of this? And then be honest with yourself. Let the word bring enough out of you to where you can go. You know what? I think I'm just trying to use folk. You know what? I think I'm just trying to get uh, uh, popular. You know what? I think I'm just trying to get rich. And then once we begin to identify that about ourselves, can we make the changes to say, you know what? Let me turn it and allow it to be about God. I want to do what I can do so I can get to know God in me. 
Now I'm ready to grow and to become beautiful. How? On the inside. Okay. So that horse, he ain't worried about, he ain't frightened, he ain't scared, even though the sword's coming at him. <clears throat> and the quiver rattles against him. And the, glitter, the glittering spear. So you got a sword, you got a quiver. A quiver has what? Arrows. The arrows are coming at him. And he got glittering spears. He got people with spears. Uh, and, and, and shields. People are coming and they got protection. The horse is still going. He's still in the midst of the battle. Still able to acknowledge the instructions of the rider. In the midst of the battle. Can we, as human beings, acknowledge the instructions from God, the instructions from the Word of God, the instructions from the Spirit of God in the midst of our battle? Or are we ready to quit? I'm a, you, you want a horse, and you're in the midst of the battle, and the horse just takes off running the other way. You got a bad horse. But if you got a horse that in the midst of the battle, when you tug to the left, it turns left. When you talk to the right, it turns right. It's doing, and it's and and there's arrows and swords and spears flying all over the place. But the horse is there, following its rider. Okay, you're in a battle. You're fighting. You got issues. You got things going on. You 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 got a battle that you're battling every day. Are you moving when the spirit of God says move? Or are you ready to run? You ready to quit? You ready to leave? So the word of God is helping us to recognize I need to be more like this. Can I can, And so God is showing and sharing this for us to be able to see this and to be able to identify not just to Job but to us. All right, let's move along. All right. He swallows up the ground uh, with fierceness and rage. In other words, he keep he 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 can cover some ground. He can run. Neither believeth that he, uh, I should say, neither believeth he that is in the uh, sound of the trumpet. So when the trumpets are sounding, sometimes they're, they're sounding to give instructions. He's not worried about it. He's not worried about any other sound that's happening other than the motion of the, the rider that's giving him the instructions. So when other things are sounding off in your life, are you listening to those sounds or are you listening to to the, the nudges of the Spirit of God, to, the, to the, 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 the slight tug of the Word of God. Is that what you're following? That's what we should be following. 25. He saith among the, 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 the trumpets, ha, ha. He's laughing at those, other, at those other sounds. And he smelleth the battle afar off and thunders of uh, the captains and the shouting. The other sounds, the other voices that are talking, he goes, ha ha, he laughs at that. I'm not paying that no attention. I'm only listening to my captain. I'm only listening to the one that's riding. That's the one that's instructing me. And that's what we need to do as uh, believers in the Lord. We need to follow our instructor, follow God. All right, 26. Uh, does the hawk fly? By thy wisdom, so he asked Job, okay, is the hawk flying by your wisdom? So now this hawk is doing something that is remarkable. It's able to utilize uh, air pressure to the point where it can lift itself from, from the ground. In other words, it can defy a force by using another force. Our earth has the force of what we call gravity, but it's able to use another force called aerodynamics to, uh, to go above it. And when the hawk uses, and when it flies, and it says it flies by wisdom, so, so what is that telling us? Well, it's using something else, something better. Gravity is not eliminated. Gravity is still here. The hawk is not flying in a gravity-less pocket. It still has gravity, but it's using something more than gravity, which is aerodynamics, to be able to fly. So sometimes we need to recognize that. That the, the, the weight of what you, and that's what gravity speaks of, the weight that holds you down, sometimes will always be there. But can you find something that can allow you to fly above it? Even though that thing that's pulling you down is still there. 
when the hawk stops with his wings and lets go of the aerodynamic abilities that, that it has been given to wisdom, guess what kicks right back in? Gravity's right there and say, come on down to earth. It's still there. But when the hawk decides, it says, let's go. It pulls back up and it can lift itself up. We need to be able to do that too. Can we encourage ourselves? Can we lift ourselves up? David talked about that. He had to learn to encourage himself. Because this world will pull you down. It says, and he stretches her wings towards the south. Uh, and it says, does the eagle mount up at uh, thy command? No, because you say something? No, the eagle uses that same wisdom, the same aerodynamic. And maketh her nest on high. Did you tell the eagle to make his nest way up in the mountains? No, it does it because that's where it can go. And sometimes you can bring your life to where you are able to go rather than having your life live in where you are forced because of gravity. You know, so the things that pull you down, you don't have to live there. Though it's always there, you don't have to build your nest there. You can build your nest on high mm -hmm. and have your life, livelihood in higher ground if you choose to use the wisdom that God gives to soar above that which will naturally pull you down. All right? Uh, 28. She dwelleth and abideth uh, in the rocks. Who is the rock of our salvation? Jesus. Are we going to dwell and abide in the rock? We should dwell and abide in the rock of God, the rock of our, our salvation, the corner's rock, the cornerstone. We should abide in Jesus. Upon the cage of the rocks uh, and the strong place. 29. For hence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. See, here's the beauty. That when you, the eagle is, is high up, Guess what the eagle can do? It can see things that it needs to see to be able to survive. Certain things you won't see and won't even notice that are to your benefit, that can feed your soul, that can feed your spirit if you keep walking in the low ground. But if you allow yourself to soar higher, you'll be able to see things that can feed you, not just naturally, but can feed you spiritually. But you got to get high like the eagle so you can see the prey. You can see what it is that you need to grab. And I will use that word prey in the sense of its cinnamon aspect. That, that Yes, you up in there and you're seeing your prey. But while you're up high, make sure that you do pray. You know, I'm just using a little play on words there. But I think it's important to, to, to just add that in. Finally, our final verse says, her young ones also suck up blood and uh, and where the sl uh, slain are, there she is. So what is he saying? That when he's able to, when the eagle is able to find its prey, the young ones can also benefit because of that. Speaks to us. Because Jesus was lifted up high, we get the benefit of the blood that he shed. Yeah, we, had a chance to eat too. we get a chance to eat as well. Exactly. And so, and that's the beauty of this. I, I tell you, this is just example after example after example, redundancy over and over and over again. But each bite of this to me was good. It was needful. Every animal brought forth a point, and I'm sure that Joe probably was like, you know, I get it, but no, he probably wasn't because when God's speaking, you don't, <laughs> you don't feel like you had enough. I don't think nobody can say, go ahead, God, I, I, I heard enough. <laughs> you no, want no, more, no. you want more, you want more. No, don't get it until, until, the last, until the last verse. See, like I said, this book is my meat and my drink. Yeah. This book is my meat and my drink. It's like, from the time I was 13 to maybe like uh, 40, you know, till I turned 40. Mm -hmm. I can see myself in all this. Right. Yep. But I never knew it was that I was that bad mm -hmm. until you started pointing it out. 
Mm-hmm. But see, when we read this, I know the change is coming. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's right. When you explain this to me every week, I see the change come. Because I read this, I read this already, but I didn't read it like I'm, I'm it's being tortured. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that's the beauty of the word. No matter how many times you go through it, I guarantee you, we could go through this. We we could stop this book of Job, it's not start it all over again, and we would still get something brand new. That's the beauty of the word, and uh, that's that's what I love about it. So next week, uh, we're gonna see that the Lord's gonna say some more, but Job's gonna have something to say too. Job's gonna say something in verse three, <laughs> and we'll pick that up uh, on next week. All right, any other comments or questions?